Um, I'm Megan Ellis, and I did the only ecology project in the entire program. And mine was a study on the health of Glenmore Lake and Pond and the differences that there were between these two areas because they look extremely different. And here in this picture, this is an area of the pond. The pond has a little bridge over it, has water hyacinths on it, and lilies, and it's very nice. So let's see. So Glenmere Lake, the water is actually comes from Greeley Loveland Irrigation, which is an irrigation water system that runs all over Colorado. This one comes from more towards the west, and then it eventually leaks out into the Poudre River. So this is has a lot of other organisms in it. So there are fish in Glenmere Lake, and that includes bluegill, chad, perch, trout, a lot of standard Colorado freshwater fish. Most of the fish actually come from upstream. They're not put in by the Department of Wildlife Management at all, except for trout. Trout are put in there for recreational purposes. Um, there is lots of algae on this lake. As you can probably see, it has a very green tint to it. But whenever you look at it in a vial, it's very clear. But there's a lot of algae on this lake. And algae can be a huge problem because it blocks out light and it blocks oxygen from reacting with the surface and depositing dissolved oxygen into the water so the organisms underneath can breathe. And as well as a lot of algae, there's lots of human influence on this lake. People are fishing. Even though it's not supposed to happen, dogs are in the water and in the lake. And there are people feeding the birds. And they're throwing bread in the water. And of course, there's always pollution and trash in the water. So that's a huge problem as well. So here is an overview map of the Mirror Lake and Pond. Up here, that's the lead out, that one, two. This is the pond right here. Three is a water pathway between the lake and the pond. So I can't, you can't really see it, it's covered by trees. Four is a dock. Five, six, seven, and eight are all lead-in areas where I can actually get to the water in the lake. 9 and 10 are where the lead-ins are. 10 is like a little, it's a tiny pond, but it's not really that different than 9. 11 and 12 are also areas where I can get to the lake. So I took samples from five of these areas. I took samples from 1 and 2, the lead-out and the pond, 4, the dock, um, as well as 10, which is the, most far, the farther away point and whenever you have a lead-in and then 12, which is almost the opposite of the lake, but it, it has a lot of algae in it, so I decided to look at that. Here we have a up close ver uh, version of the lake, and you can see there's a island right in the middle. That island's untouched by humans most of the time. It's what we call a duck island. They have, there's tons of nests in the trees. Birds live there, turtles live there. It's just, it's basically nature concentrated on a tiny island. The water around this island can get down to 15 feet deep so that trout can spawn because they can't live in very warm waters. So there are various amounts of fish here, but you need to have a variety so that all can survive. And then here's the pond. It's not a very good picture, but here's the pond. As you can see, there's lilies and water hyacinths, and then there's a bridge where I took my sample, and this is the lead out, and there's a lot of vegetation there as well. So why do we test the water? This water leads into the Poudre River. So that's a major river that runs through Colorado and also is a, we play in it. We use it for recreation. We, it can even affect our drinking water. So if this water isn't safe for something like fish, then it's probably not safe for humans either. So I did this water quality test to see what the difference was between the pond and the lake, and also if there was if it was safe for fish and other organisms, or other organisms to live in there. So I just wanted to make sure that this water was clean and that it was a good idea to have. So the materials I used for my project were a way to collect water without contaminating it, and that would mean things like I used the jug on the end of a pole, and I couldn't reach the water, so I just kind of dipped it in, and I was able to mostly get uncontaminated water, or gloves, so you can put your hands in the water and submerge the vial without really getting anything dirty. A water quality test kit, I used Hatches Fish Farmer Water Quality Test Kit, and this tests for carbon dioxide, dissolved oxygen, ammonia, and chloride. Um, I would also recommend a pH meter or a litmus paper to use on site. 
So I tested the water right there because if you transport it, something can happen. And I need to make sure that it is as accurate as I can possibly get it. And then I had 10 50 milliliter vials and some jars so I could transport water. So for the vials, I used those to transport my water. And the jars, I just collect algae and things like that to look at because it looks cool. So my method was to collect water from selected sites, which are again one, two, which are the lead out in the pond, four, a dock on the lake, 10, um, the lead into the lake, 12, which is another side of the lake. And then I would test the pH, that's my pH meter. I would test the pH meter at the site of every area, so I just tested on the shore because I wasn't able to get to the island or anywhere in the center. And then when I collected my vials of water, I would test for carbon dioxide, dissolved oxygen, ammonia, and chloride. So testing for carbon dioxide. So add, I would take a 20 milliliter sample and I would add one drop of the phenylphthalein indicator solution and this would show me how much carbon dioxide is in there by turning pink whenever the sodium hydroxide solution is added. So I would add one drop of sodium hydroxide solution at a time and then the number of drops multiplied by five is the milligrams per liter of carbon dioxide in the water or parts per million. Same thing. And you can see kind of a blurry picture in the background. That is an original sample and that's what it looks like whenever you it turns pink. Next thing is dissolved oxygen. So for dissolved oxygen, this actually is a kind of complicated process. As you can see, it has its own special bottle and needs its own special stopper. And what you have to do when you get this sample is you have to dunk it underneath the water and you have to cap it underneath the water so there's no contamination from the atmosphere to, that could add oxygen to the water that's not actually there. So what I did is you take that and then you add oxygen regions one and two, which is just what they're labeled. And then you have to shake until flock settles and flock is looks kind of like fluffy stuff. And then you add the third oxygen powder and shake that up again. And then you take 20 milliliters of, this is what it looks like after the third powder is added. So you take 20 milliliters of that and then you add sodium sulfate standard solution one drop at a time until it turns from about that color to clear. So every drop is one milligram per liter of dissolved oxygen in your water. And then for ammonia, uh, I filled one clear test tube with five milliliters of the sample that I took, as well as five milliliters of deionized water. And then I add one drop of Rochelle salt to each, and then three drops of Nestle reagent to each of them, and I swirl them around. And then I have to wait for 10 minutes for the color to develop. And then I put them into a color comparator, which is just a little device that has a disc in it that has the different colors on it. And you use that to compare the colors of the two test tubes. And then it will give you a reading down at the bottom of how many milligrams per liter is in there. Now, for the ammonia test, it will give you the amount of nitrogen, basically, whenever you did that test. To get the amount of ammonia that's toxic, you would have to take that amount of nitrogen, multiply it by a number that you find from a table whenever you test the pH and the temperature, and then you have to divide that by 100 and then multiply it by 1.2, and then that's ammonia, toxic ammonia, then milligrams per liter. And finally, chloride. You can see that's clear and that's not so clear. So for chloride, I would add the chloride to indicator, which is just chloride. It's it's just chloride. To 20 milliliters of the sample that I took, and then I would mix that up, and then I'd add one drop of silver nitrate solution until the silver uh, until the solution turns a red brown, something like that. And then the number of drops multiplied by 30 is milligrams per liter of just pure chloride ions. However, if you multiply that by 50 instead, then you get the number of um, salt. It's just salt, so sodium chloride. Um, and that's how much salt is in the water. So these are my results. They kind of look like jumbled numbers, but so these are all the sites. And I only took um, samples from selected sites, but I took pH mold sites. So for pH, you can see that the lake, which is these 
uh, 4 through 8, and then 11 and 12 is all very basic. It's all ranging above 9. In most cases, it was either about 9, and in some tests, I got 10.5, and that's insanely basic. And then this is the lead out in the pond, and that's pretty neutral. It's a little bit basic, but it's still in the 7. And for 9 and 10, the lead in, again, very, very neutral. For the oxygen, you can see that there is a much more oxygen with 36 and 41 milligrams per liter in the lake than there is in any other area, which is around 30 and 20. For carbon dioxide, you can see that there is absolutely no carbon dioxide at all in the lake. There's nothing. It's, I tested for it repeatedly. There's no, it turns pink immediately. There's nothing at all in there, but there is um, carbon dioxide in the lead out, the lead in, and the pond. So everywhere else but the lake, there is carbon dioxide. For chloride, you can see that there is more salt or chloride ions in everywhere else but the lake. The lake is very low. And there are trace amounts of toxic ammonia in sites one and two, which are the lead out in the pond. So this would mean that there is just a little bit of ammonia, but because it's such a small amount, it's nothing to worry about. So what does this mean for pH? So most freshwater fish can only survive in the pH range between 5 and 9. And if the water is too acidic or basic or there's something wrong with it, the temperature is too high, they can't spawn and they can't survive. So this lake, which is extremely basic with most of the time ranging above 9 and even going to 10, it would seem like most fish would die in here. However, the problem would be I'm taking samples from the shore. The farthest out I could possibly get was about 3 or 4 feet, and that's still fairly basic. So if I was able to get samples from the middle of the lake, I might be able to see that it's more neutral, but at least still on the shoreline, nothing could survive there. You can see it really kind of gross analogy. So for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is used by plants whenever they uh, do photosynthesis. So basically, um, plants will take carbon dioxide and sunlight and they'll convert that into glucose and oxygen. They put out oxygen and they use the glucose for energy. So the more plants there are on the lake, then the more carbon dioxide will be used and the more oxygen will be produced. And if there's no carbon dioxide in the lake system, then that means that the plants are really working hard and that there's no carbon dioxide to be used at all in the lake. I also take all my samples in the afternoon, and it's been very sunny the whole time, so most of these plants have been working all day. So that's already a problem. But also with carbon dioxide, there's carbonic acid. So the fact that there's no carbon dioxide in the water at all shows that there is um, no carbon dioxide in the water shows that it's, uh, there's no carbonic acid either, which would mean that it would be fairly basic because there's no acid to balance it out. For oxygen, all animals need oxygen to survive. It's a fact. So plants produce it from photosynthesis and put it out into the water. So there's more oxygen in the lake because there are more plants that produce it. And because there's more oxygen, there's probably more potential to survive which would explain why there is a fair more amount of fish in the lake than there is in the pond or any other areas, and that's why people fish there. Uh, for ammonia, ammonia is put out by fish normally. They excrete it. It's just part of what they do. If it's in high concentrations, it's a problem. So it's fairly low. It's nothing to worry about. And for chloride, chloride associates with sodium chloride or salt, and if there's too much salt, which is 860, parts per million or one uh, milligram per liter, that means there's too much, but it didn't even get close to this. And in conclusion, this lake is safe and fairly good for anything. Uh, here's my references. I didn't have a lot of basic biology left.